We think we're probably one of the best in the world at what we do as a pure play AI company in that space. That's been tough. We were spending so much on freelancers, basically like, you know, on Upwork, you know, like freelancers creating content, researching, like we we're spending millions of dollars a year on that. And so I approached some professors at the University of Alberta. I wanted to do algorithmic content generation. We've probably had the most success right now in areas in finance. Like we had no idea what we were doing three years ago, but the project was a colossal failure. The biggest mistake we made in the past was taking too much equity off of the founder's cap table. Studio founders, they have shining object syndrome when right. like, 100%, oh, about me. totally yeah. right. I know you hate it because I hate it. What excites me the most is health. I mean, I think we'll create a unicorn or two in clean tech. I think we'll create five of them on the health side. But if we just invested in health today, we'd be bankrupt. When you model that across portfolios and across an industry, it's game changing. I hope we're sitting here in 10 years, I'm talking about like the multiple unicorns we've created in oncology, in you know mental health, in diabetes, because data is gonna be used to transform everything we do. And there's no nothing more important than health, right? We've hosted already five online conferences for venture studios, VCs, and family offices. And I'm inviting you to join our paid community called Venture Studio Family. If you are a Venture Studio founder or a representative or a manager of a Venture Studio, you want to learn the best practices and know how different Venture Studios operate. So you can find the best ways on how to attract founders great founders to Venture Studios, or how to create successful companies with not super star founders. You can learn how to fundraise into your studio, into your studio fund, or into your startups created in the studio. You can learn how to create sustainable studio, which has cash flow and which can be not dependent on external venture capital. You can find the best ways to manage the studio if you join this community. So check the link venture studio family uh, in the description and join the community of about 30 venture studios so Corey, very happy that you joined this podcast and we'll talk about uh, alta ml today about ai venture studio in Canada and your experience and how you came to, to launch an S studio. So please, can you share the story of Alta ML and uh, your previous entrepreneurial experience? Yeah, for sure. So we didn't mean to start a venture studio. This is an accidental studio. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess I'll start off with. I've been in tech for about 25 years, so I'm, I'm one of the old old entrepreneurs, I guess you could say. Uh, I spent a lot of my career in the digital media space. So I was the co-founder for a financial site called Investopedia. Um, so I started that in 1999 um, while I was still in university, and uh, then we bootstrapped that and sold it to Forbes in the late 2000s. To be honest, I was frankly just managing capital. I was was not going to get back into the startup game. Mm. But people kept on pitching me saying, hey, why don't you do an Investopedia for this industry or that? And like think like really boring, like industrial safety or corrosion, these like traditional industries that hadn't yet moved online. You, you might have stumbled upon Investopedia if you Googled a financial term. Essentially, it was a timeless content. And so it was a great business model because it was like an annuity. You would create the content once and then, you know, keep on getting traffic over the years. So, you know, we threw in some capital, built out a platform and sort of launched about 10 of these Pedia sites. I share that part of the story because we were spending so much on freelancers, basically like, you know, on Upwork, you know, like freelancers creating content, researching, mm -hmm. like we we're spending millions of dollars a year on that. And so I approached some professors at the University of Alberta here in Canada in 2015 saying I wanted to do algorithmic content generation. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind. This is 2015. So yeah. Gen AI wasn't even close to a term. The paper for Gen AI, generative AI transformers that really enabled LLMs came out 2017, kind of really 2018 got some buzz. And obviously mm -hmm. we all know the story of open AI and all the rest of it. So, so I was off by five years and maybe half a billion dollars in terms of what the project would have taken. So the project was a colossal failure. Mm. But I was exposed to this amazing computing science department. And like, so the University of Alberta has been a top 10, top 20 school worldwide for the academic side of artificial intelligence and machine learning. 
because they attracted some key profs, most notably a guy named Dr. Richard Sutton. So he literally wrote the textbook on reinforcement learning. You've got this ecosystem here, which is, let's call it an emerging tech ecosystem, but very, very high talent from the engineering perspective. So we just started hiring ML engineers. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I mean, it's really only been the last, we're about five years old now. The problem I was trying to solve, I was trying to build AI products, but I couldn't get access to data. So mm. we started building relationships with corporates, building these kind of AI labs alongside so we can actually work together. So we'd co-develop so we get access to data and understand those workflows. And we can probably get into this more, but then at, we were always trying to create products over time, you know, probably about two, two and a half years ago was the first time I even heard Startup Studio or Venture Studio mm. and mm. said, actually, like, that's how we should actually brand this. And so over the last couple of years, instead of investing off our balance sheet, we've moved to a more standard studio structure. And we can kind of get into that if you like. But that's the origin story anyhow. What projects have you built uh, during this time? So during these five years, are they like uh, just separate startups or products or can, how can you describe your portfolio? Right. So, so at first we thought we'd, I mean, again, when we weren't a studio per se, we thought we'd be able to build specific AI products and we'd have like a services side of the business and then various products. What we found after working on hundreds of different AI projects is that we developed a thesis really around vertical or very industry specific. What we saw is that the hyperscalers, as well as Databricks and Snowflake, were essentially taking out the horizontal layer. So we saw so many AI projects uh, that, frankly, were you'd see a really start smart PhD come in, um, you know, try to actually work on a project, not have a unique edge on data, and then all of a sudden start selling tools that they're selling to other AI companies, right? And we've seen this over and over again, right? And so really developed as this was industry specific, your sales team is different. There's, a, there's not a whole lot of commonality anymore. And so those had to become separate companies. We've probably had the most success right now in, in you know, areas in finance, um, specifically asset management, um, but then also with banks and, and um, less or so with insurance. We've learned a lot of hard lessons in insurance. Where we see the most opportunity going forward is in clean tech in the medium term and health over the long range. You, we're starting to really build these clusters of expertise around finance, you know, energy and clean tech, and then health. Mm -hmm. So you partner with corporations now? Uh, Sometimes, that's true, yeah. So we've learned, and like this, and this is where... Any studio obviously can create from the ground up or they can attract a founder or some combination there. Having mm -hmm. that labs business does a few things. It gives us access to getting paid to go from zero to one. So when you see hundreds of use cases, we, you know, that helps inform our investment thesis. I think early on, we went in with a number of larger corporates with the thinking that we could be joint venture partners. That's been tough. <laughs> <laughs> corporate innovation is really is really hard right like it doesn't matter what industry it is right it very rarely works and so what we've found is that like we've gone in in multiple instances in different industries and we've had an executive champion that loves us we have say like a three to five to seven million dollar sort of budget to be able to build out an, an organization but executives don't last forever And mm, so what's yeah. happened to us on more time, more times than I, like literally three times, we've had a change of the executive. And then once that executive leaves, all of a sudden, even though there's been all this investment, the new person doesn't want to actually continue it on. Mm -hmm. And so we've succeeded in getting new companies funded that way. And even had like really product market fit or that first, you know, customer zero, we call it. But our rule going forward here is we'll work in those labs um, and add value for those organizations on the solutions point of view, um, but then we'll be coming in and investing in it. And, and we don't mind having corporate partners having some upside or some limited exclusivity, but we won't give up operational control any longer. And that's just been a lesson from trial and error. And, and I wouldn't change how we did it. And we had you know, great intentions from various partners at the time, but any new person starting a studio, I'd say don't give up operational control because it's really, really hard to break through that mindset. In case of partners with corporations, or even when you launch independent startups, you would also not uh, not uh, give up control. Yeah, like I, I think there's lots of partnering is good. Just control over like, 
you're sitting there in a product meeting trying to like debate and explain like the basics of of what your MVP is. And it's just like people get high up in corporations because they're risk mitigators. They've got a good business and it's there. They're not, net, you know, in very few organizations do you see, you know, executives rewarded for taking these outside risks. I mean, that's what entrepreneurs do. So there's just this clash, right? And, and like I said, it's really hard to find those people. Even when you find them, you have to deal with their people underneath because usually they're high enough up. So you need to, so you're battling with this next layer. Mm-hmm. And then every four years, you see executives get put out anyway. And so by the time you're in the middle of launching something, that's been our experience. And, and maybe we've got the wrong formula. I don't know, right? We have many corporate partners that we work with where we can add significant value in AI for them because of the services lab side of the business that we have. We think we're probably one of the best in the world at what we do as a pure play AI company in that space. But we learn lessons from that and then we'll invest our own capital and putting together a unique arrangement where there's still partnerships that don't involve giving up operational control over the tech roadmap and the go-to-market. So you have uh, two pieces of your business or parts. One is services company, service company, which provides uh, like venture builder as a service or just like creating some AI. Well, and that's what I'm saying. Initially, we were venture builder as a service. Now we've gotten out of that. We'll say we're just a straight, we'll build AI labs. So, you know, think of these as long-term multi-year recurring kind of like labs where we'll go in and work on, you know, understanding the backlog of use cases, experimentation, and putting AI solutions into production, right? So we'll keep that that we really shut down the corporate venture builder side of it because we couldn't we couldn't figure out the governance right mm. but so, that helps so, pays that that gives us op, uh, see let's see the opportunities and helps pay the bills in terms of it funds mm-hmm. the venture studio mm-hmm. uh, so you said that you build ai labs for for other companies so like is it is it true uh, yes. that this is this is what what they what they need and what they pay pay for you and you cover your cost for the service team and also for for the venture building team it, creating independent uh, startups it, it, exactly important. now when we first started out i thought the majority of use cases we'd work with with a corporate would have commercial applicability so i was like 80 or 90 percent of these you know not everything will but like let's say 80 percent do our experience has been the other way around In our experience, only 10 to 20% of those use cases could turn into a company. So like we've seen now, I think 450 AI use cases. Hmm. So that that becomes part of our edge as an investor because at the end of the day, I mean, most VCs are going to hate a services business. I get it, right? I would still argue that we've got recurring revenue, long-term deals, and, and over time, we're actually getting to a fairly healthy gross margin in that business, right? And we're adding value for those partners. Like we see stuff that no other startup could see. So sitting next to a portfolio manager that manages hundreds of millions of dollars, you can't get access to that person. It's very, very difficult. So being able to actually have a data science team and a product team understand how that professional thinks, that is part of the edge that we have. And it's not, again, it's it's like maybe 10% of the time or 20% of the time when we find a use case that works, we'll come and say, hey, Mr. Corporate Partner, let us invest alongside. We have an ability to actually align interest with you. Maybe we give an exclusivity in a market. Maybe we give them some of the equity upside. The key there is that you need the entrepreneur, you need the founder in control of their destiny. And if they have to convince an executive in terms of that product roadmap, in our experience, I, I haven't found a way to make that work. It's this interesting tension, Max, right? Because you need to pay the bill somehow, right? Like I, I'm always talking to other studio founders and going, Okay, like unless you have a hundred million in assets under management, how uh-huh. do you fund your early stage work? Like we spend, like let's call it a million and a half a year in uh-huh. early stage company creation, from that ideation to the experimentation to all that, right? Uh huh. You can do it, like you know. So you haven't even got to the investment team. That's just my studio team and just the early stage machine learning engineers, product managers to be able to actually do that work. I would love to find a way to pay the bills on that without it, but I don't have a hundred million in assets under management, man. Right? Like, yeah. First of all, let me understand: like, how many companies independent have you built? 
Right. Uh, so are you, are you building? So we've, we've got six that have come out of the studio to date over the last few years. And um, there's a graveyard of probably another three to five that are there that were uh, that we learned along the way that uh, I mean, uh, we'll put this out there on YouTube, right? So anybody that's actually disciplined enough to, 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 to actually watch through, like there's been a whole bunch that we wouldn't put out because as we fine tune our process over the years, ones that didn't necessarily, like we had no idea what we were doing three years ago, right? And so as we fine tune our process, it's like, I'd say there's, there's a bunch that really got killed before they even got to the first to launch. Right. Um, but now we, we do have six that are actually out there and our backlog. Um, I mean, this is the crappy thing about a horrible funding market. Um, I've got about 15 to 20 ideas at the top of the funnel. that are waiting for kind of their pre-seed stage investment. Right. So for us, that's anywhere between 150 and 500K. We feel over the next five years, like we've launched these six we've got, and two or three of them are very absolute rocket ships right now that are kind of, you know, post seed, almost will be ready for series A, we think in 2024, with a massive top of funnel now at the top of the studio. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So six companies are already independent. Yeah. Or, or independent or semi-independent. I would say like that we've got to that point on there, right? So... Can you describe your business model? Like what is equity split? What, what are the founders you're looking for? How much money do you invest? Or like your, how much money in terms of your team cost is going to launch one, one company? Yeah. Okay. Then let me get into the numbers here. Cause I mean, no one cares about this without the actual detail. So, and frankly, if there's any other studio founders out there, we're happy to share our playbook. If you'll show yours, um, we think our edge is in the AI side, not on the studio side of things. And so I'm mm-hmm. um, happy to get into to, to details of exactly how we think about that. And keep in mind that this is how we our happy path going forward. There's obviously always deviations from it. And it's not necessarily the same of what we've done in the past. The biggest mistake we made in the past was taking too much equity off of the founder's cap table. Mm. Often we would go in and... I'm going to maybe set like when we talk about like the dual entity model, I mean, Matt, can we talk about this in terms of the dual entity model yeah. or that side of it? Yeah. Versus, dual, versus dual so, entity model. so our audience is very educated because yeah, they all that, read my research on venture studios and they know that studios. Exactly. Have- so if you haven't read Max's work, you need to, right? And so I'm going to assume that level of it, right? So we're set up of standard dual entity model where C Corp, a regular corporation for the studio. Um, and then we're in the process of, of now investing through our L, kind of GPLP structure on the fund side of it, right? So beforehand, we've only really launched the fund recently. And so in the past, when we were always investing off our balance sheet, it got really messy because we were just coming in with straight commons and then you keep on putting in money and, you know, you keep on putting in more and more and more. And then all of a sudden we had, we just ran into issues on the cap table there because of it. I think having... Um, in the studio, we view initially, we want to do, we wouldn't do anything less than 10% off that commons as an institutional co-founder in the business, mm-hmm. um, up to maybe 25, maybe 30%, depending on how much we've work we've put in, right? So um, on day one on the cap table, that's what we're looking for. When we come in, usually there could be anywhere from as low as 100, 150 K worth of investment from the team. Sometimes over half a million dollars worth of, of like, because keep in mind, if it's coming from one of our corporate labs, there might have been half a million to a million worth of work that's there and some IP that we managed to get out, right? Again, you need to negotiate that, but there's something there. It's not zero. We try to give our founders an edge where we've got access to a very deep AI team. And so anything that we actually do from our back office services, as well as technical, we do at cost. So we try to turn that fixed cost for that founding team into a variable cost that is at the discretion of the founder. We could get into that, but ideally early stage, we would do, let's call it 10 to 25% of commons from the, 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 you know, founding cap table. And then we look to, as something's ready for pre-seed, we view pre-seed as 500 to 500 to 750, but we will often tranche that out from like 250 and 500. And then that investment there would be through the fund, right? So that is, um, uh, you know. Preferred shares. Yeah, well, because we wouldn't be prefs right off the bat because we don't have the valuation. So we would do that as a convertible note um, mm-hmm. on day one. No interest or anything like that, but say convertible note slash safe, right? We would do that on um, from that investment. And then we're looking to co-lead the seed round where we're looking to bring in a, a strategic partner where in my LPA, I have to have a minimum 25% from outside investors at that seed round. 
So at that point, maybe you do that at a price round. Maybe you keep kicking the can down the road on valuation with another convertible note. Oh. But what it means anyway is like you think of the pre-seed, we'd probably be somewhere between, you know, seven and a half and twelve and a half percent initially right because it's a standard kind of convertible note and then you'd be able to actually be a big player in the seed round so that seed round should like look like any other seed round that you would see from a traditional venture firm it's just that we're clearly involved early on and we want to be that first money in so because we've stage gated from you know that first 10 to 20k of experimentation to the first 150k within the studio and then the pre-seed and the seed round you know, there's really sort of like four or five sort of stage gates that you would look through as it transitions from studio into fund. What offer your entrepreneurs get? How much equity do they get? So now what is your ideal picture now if you are launching a new startup? Yeah. So if we had, uh, so a brand new startup, if we went in with a founding team, that initial founding team would have, let's call it like 60%. 60% for the founding team, 15% for a stock option plan, right? Takes you to 75%, then we're the last 25%. So like that would be the ideal cap table on day one. I think you need to have that founding team with the majority for sure, right? So again, like, you know, 60, 15, 25, you know, it could be, you know, we have some where we're at 10%, right? You know, maybe there's some where it tilts a little bit over where, where I don't think we would ever want to be more than 30 or 35 percent for any of the new companies we create. It just it turns the cap table upside down. Right. And so I don't I can't make the numbers work to make sure the founders aren't diluted too much if we're a majority on day one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But again, you saw as well through other capital, like differentiate between that being a founding shareholder, a founding partner in the business and an investor. And, and I think even though the studio is related or the studio is related to the fund i think ex explaining to the founder listen like you're going out for capital anyway like yes my lps are going to be the ones here but i want to save you a year of your life and time because raising that first half a million to a million like you're asking your uncle and your friends and families and i mean mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah, friends yeah. family and fools it's called that for a reason right like it's the riskiest capital in so we want to write that first check for the riskiest capital as quickly as possible and save you time to focus on product and selling Can you tell more about what type of founders are you looking for? And probably, uh, so you saw that it's difficult to attract, maybe, maybe it's my opinion, uh, difficult to attract great founders if you are taking a majority of equity. Or what, what was the reason that you, you are looking now to, to take less equity? Well, Is it the quality of founders or, some, or future fundraising for startups? I'm a builder who's trying to be more and more of VC, right? Like I've invested my own capital and off my own balance sheet for all these years, right? But it's not like I've worked for a VC firm for all these years. So we want to build the reputation of being the most founder friendly. And I know people say that, but I think it's bullshit until like, you know, when you actually get to like how you're negotiating shareholder agreements and how you're actually mm -hmm. making these investments, like the primary factor of success is the founding team that you're going to have. And so like they need to have the most upside because they're putting in the biggest risk. So I think that you make more taking 20 or 25 percent and get, you know, putting in a lot for that. Right. Um, then trying to actually control that founder. I mean, what great founders want to be controlled? I mean, if you wanted to be controlled, you just go get a job. Right. So like, I don't I don't think it's like a trade off. I think you actually make more money in that way. Mm hmm. Well, what the source is like, do, do you think that it is a bottleneck for, for a studio to attract founders or uh, it is not a big part of, of the studio attracting? What are sources? How, how do you attract them? It's a great, th I mean, this is the biggest question, right? Like, I, I think it's all about personal network and relationships, right? I think, you know, I think we're going to try to scale that by publishing more content around decisions we've made. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, we've got a few founders in the studio right now that as things work out and we do a great job, I mean, them talk, great founders know other founders, right? Like it's always going to be word of mouth. I, I, I don't know that you can scale that, that that's like a situation where you say, oh, I want to talk, have hundreds of conversations with different founders. I think it's a matter of like building trust and like trust is, is a personal thing. I think a lot of it is just saying like, hey, listen, I'm putting my butt on the line. I'll put early money in. Here's why this is an edge. You'll make more money with me then on the outside, because we can give you an edge in AI. Like, and if you want, I can make all the pain go away of all the bullshit, like the finance and the HR and all those things in the back end that I know you hate it because I hate it. 
And we're not going to try to make money off you at that. We just want to get our costs out on that. So as long as you're cool with that, you know, can we give you an edge, right? If you think we can, you can have an edge building an AI company with us, then we're your right choice. If not, then there's lots of other people with deeper pockets. I mean, yeah, like that's, that's kind of the pitch, but it's also, it's like a personal pitch that I have to make, right? Like I've had an exit, I've had, you know, one pretty decent exit and a bunch of smaller exits in the digital media side. So I, I think I've been in, you know, it's just about having some empathy and understanding how hard it is to be in their seat, right? I feel like that's not a great scalable answer though, Max. Hey, I don't know. Like it's, 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 yeah, it's, no, no. it's hard. It's, it's great. It's great. I understand. I understand. When you are building AI companies, do you attract founders already with ideas or you are saying uh, them that like we are AI venture builder Go, go to us, we have a bunch of ideas, you will work with them and you don't need experience in, uh, in creating uh, AI companies. So- it's, it's a great question. And to date, it's been more founders coming in with their idea, but we think over time, we're going to have more and more companies we create where it's just, you know, having founders with an exit. I mean, especially now with all the hype in AI, if you can have a relationship with a great founder and say, hey, by the way, we've also done this initial work you know, it's mm-hmm. in your industry, it's in an area that you're interested in, like clean tech, for example, hey, we've done dozens of projects that have to do with sustainability and, and mitigating carbon, right? Do any of these interest you? So more and more, we're trying to bring in founders to some of our ideation sessions and try to get those conversations going. So to date, it's really been, you know, the former of like, okay, you know, if somebody comes with an idea, and they know us, because they, they know from locally from a reputation as people who can build shit in AI, right? There's that. that. The next phase, I think it's just as we have enough wins under our belt of like proving that we're a great builder and that we can have that edge, I think we'll be able to say like, hey, look at our backlog. We've got dozens of ideas here. Take a pick, right? Like, you know, we have a bunch of ideas that are almost, you know, on the shelf kind of ready for implementation. We just need the right founder. I was looking at, sorry, I was looking at one opportunity to this morning with the team. It's about using LLMs to optimize the building process that architecture and engineering firms would have, right? 12% of the cost of buildings is for rework that's being done because like the initial designs weren't necessarily done the right way. And there's this process where construction companies and engineering engineering firms and architectures go back and forth. We think we can actually build a solution that cuts a significant chunk out of that. And so we were debating, okay, do you need the founder in? Because we've got an idea. We're building, like we've put in a first, I think we're at 60 or 75K. And we're, we're going to likely green light another 50K to get to the next stage to get some more data. And so the debate that we were having was, okay, can we wait till seed stage? Or is this more like the pre-seed where we get the founder, right? So it's an interesting question here where we've got something like, that's a tough thing to figure. Like, do you find a founder who's got an exit in the engineering space and tech, like that's a tough one, right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you said before we started uh, the recording that it's very difficult to stay disciplined with, with some process. You defined that like we have this stage git model and we will work that model. So it's very difficult. And I know some studios, they, they say that we, we don't have playbooks. So like we are just doing some right thing things in the right moment. So what do you think about st- the stage gate model and how you... I, I think it's everything. I think I think that being disciplined there, because like I fall in love with every single idea. You know, like if you're not sure, you're always looking for... I mean, to me, it's not at the early stage, the risk. It's, okay, what needs to be true for this to happen, right? And like, you know, the, the vast majority of ideas, I think are very... It's not that often I'm like, I hate this idea. Like, because usually like... The ideas are solid, right? Being data driven and ensuring that you stick to that, I think is absolutely, and because it doesn't mean you kill an idea forever. Like, let's say you go through and you spend, like we'll spend all the time, we'll make lots and lots of $100,000 bets trying to build out prototypes. I think the majority we will not fund the next investment the learnings you have from that, it doesn't mean that that idea is always dead. Maybe you just missed something. Maybe you didn't have the right founder. Maybe... Like, I'll give you an example. We've worked on one application, one solution, fighting wildfire. So it's like wildfire pre-suppression. Okay, clearly everyone, I don't, does anybody think that wildfires won't be a growth area? Unfortunately, right? There's meaningful purpose in this, right? We've actually worked with a government in proving that we can actually save millions of dollars a year using AI to predict where fire is going to happen, where to optimize equipment. Hmm. 
only after many conversations with founders do we think that we actually understand that industry. So we haven't green lit the next investment yet because we're still something's missing, right? It's still, we haven't got the data. We haven't got that next client to do it. And it's really easy to pull the trigger and say, yes, I'm going to fund this investment. But we say like one of the elements of our stage gate, when we go beyond like that initial investigation to an actual pre-seed is you need to actually have the pilot, ideally a paid pilot. You need to have the customer. You need to actually know that someone wants to pay for this. Mm -hmm. And like, that's really hard, Right. And so if you don't have that, you need to not fund it, right? So it's not kill, but you can't put in more until you solve that. And the problem is, frick, this is where I've lost most of my money. I lost 750K on digital pathology because I kept on saying, my gut is here, my gut is here. And we want to trust our gut, but we're not that freaking smart, man. Like, I'm no smarter than you. It's the process matters, right? That's why studios should create value, I think. Still, I think there are different approaches and every approach must might be successful. So, for example, I imagine that a potential studio where, where you attract founder and you say, we are with you, we'll be successful in building a company. We don't know what, what it will be, but uh, this company will be called with your surname and whatever happens, so uh, this is this is your name on this company, and yeah, you yeah. have to, to make it successful, and we'll pivot as many times as as we need uh, to create a successful company. So, and I think so. When I think about this idea, that like strong determination, that uh, yeah. okay, this founder have has to build a successful company. Doesn't matter like 100k, 1 million. We'll put until we find so. Uh, I think that's, that's a really like, interesting point, Max. You're yeah, burning, like I, you're burning your bridges. That's okay. So, so uh, doesn't matter how many <laughs> how much money we put here, but but you you have to find right. Yeah, that's uh, where I disagree. Yes. That's the difference between a studio and a VC. I think so. I don't think that they should have a blank check. So you're not wrong. Like I think earlier on, and we just did this with because a founder had a previous exit. So a founder with an exit is there. Like that's okay. You've proven you can do it. You've been on that journey. Mm -hmm. But listen, I'm a founder with an exit and I know how many millions of dollars I've lost with my own internal investments doing things after that. Just because you had the success once, I mean, that's a much higher probability you're going to get. I still think you can say, we're going to back you on something. Let's go off and like, let's put in our first quarter million dollars on this project. But if we don't get to this point of it, even though you're in charge, like, this might not be the last idea. We Maybe there's a different idea. So we might back that person in a different idea. But I think where you'll lose the money is you just give that, you just give them a couple million bucks right off the bat without actually proving out that you've got problem, you know, that you're actually solving the right problem. I think that's where, I don't know, that's my, but it's an interesting debate. Like this is the question, isn't it? Like if you can solve this, you can create billions of dollars worth of wealth, right? Like, yeah. Um Interesting about ideas. So now I thought about that uh, you're working with AI and it is a technology. So like it's not a vertical uh, that's for some specific customers. And I understand that there is, so if you are a vertical studio, you might have advantage of reusing your customer and partner base right. and understanding the like all problems and pains of, of this customer. So like it's obvious. With technology, I think it's a bit more difficult because you might find this application in many spheres, and in, maybe uh, this is like not prediction, but but some some idea that maybe in like five or ten years, AI studios, so like every digital agency now will will call themselves like AI, so they will not actually call because like yeah. it will be obvious yeah. that all all development uh, agencies they use AI. So, and, and here is the question, uh, do you think, like, what is real additional value? So I understand that now AI is growing and it is a hot topic. And uh, like you, because you had previous experience, you have advantage to, to be now in this point. But in some time, so I, uh, will you have this advantage uh, in front of other, I don't know, development agencies? No. Or it will like every every development agencies will have their own AI uh, tools and uh, they will not call themselves AI because like it will be obvious that uh, 
everyone uses. Yeah. yeah. So you, I think you're right. Like there's a shelf life on our current model here in terms of the, or not our model. I think there's a shelf life on our edge, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. would it be an advantage to know more about the cloud than someone else right now? Like, of course not. That's stupid, right? But like, I mean, back in the old day, I swapped out hard drives and built web servers by myself, right? Like, you know, like there was no cloud. There was none of that out there, right? And so in all areas, I think your your core thesis or your assumption in a question, you're right, right? Like that is, that is not a long-term advantage. I believe the advantage in AI is driven by deep understanding of the workflows and a unique edge on data in that industry. Mm. So mm, yeah, yeah. So data access to data, probably. Yeah. So we are a vertical AI company. So our investment thesis needs to be applied. So not a science project. So we're not like DeepMind is spending a billion plus a year on research. Mm. I don't have that bankroll. I don't think anybody has that bankroll. I don't think you can compete on the on the research side of it. Plus the whole open source community in academia, right? So we're applied AI. We're not inventing new algorithms, right? Second, we're vertical in nature, so industry specific. And, and then third, we're, we're enterprise or some more B2B. We don't think we can compete against Silicon Valley on the consumer facing tech. The data sets that Amazon, Tencent, Facebook, the, 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 what they have about you from an ad perspective and from an e-com perspective, we don't think we can compete there. Mm -hmm. So with that thesis, our model is really based around partnerships. That's why it lends so well to a studio where if we've got a founder that's an expert in you know, this area of health or this area of clean tech, that's where we think we can uh, we think we can still give an edge in the short run, short to medium term. Let's say the next three to ten years, we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Putting models into production is not a trivial solved problem, and we're seeing this even with LLMs now. Everyone's using ChatGPT. Well, how many companies are really actually using large language models and making a substantial difference and getting those into production? And I'm not talking about a ChatGPT wrapper here. I'm talking about to take and actually have an LLM, whether it's GPT or Llama or another one of the big LLMs that's out there and tie that with a separate database or build that unique knowledge graph, that source of truth and put it together in a, pack in a package that drives return on investment. There's going to be hundreds of companies in that space that are creating that, but it's not necessarily something that is just, it's a non-trivial problem to solve. And you still have an edge around the data and these other pieces of it. So with our last, uh, our legal tech business, our staff level NLP, natural language processing, our staff level engineer, he moved off and he's the C2 of that business. So we offer an edge as a studio, both from the expertise in AI, but also that talent that we can initially bring over. When we talk in five years, I, I'll let you know whether that advantage has been evaporated or not. For the next one to three years, I know it will be an edge. And the question is over the course of, you know, do we have to pivot like, you know, down the road to other forms of technology, whatever. I still believe that all software is going to be eaten by AI. And so the opportunity is so massive that there will be enough edge that we will be able to provide that we'll be able to actually create a substantial amount of value and you know for the foreseeable future. That's a long answer to the question, but you're asking the tough questions, man. Yeah. <laughs> there some fields when you understand customers better so you you gave two examples of like uh fire prediction yeah. ai model uh and then construction saving construction tool <laughs> yeah for, uh, for companies i put, so, I put uh, broadly like so many of the projects we've done have um some profession like so finance and legal have been a lot of the investments we've done to date over the next three years, we think the biggest opportunity is, is broadly in clean tech. So that includes kind of, there's a number of utility of industries underneath there. So it's energy utilities, but even this example that I gave on, on construct savings and construction, there's, there's a sustainability and carbon impact that ties into that. So where I'm from in Canada is actually like, think of it as almost like little Texas, like it's got a huge oil and gas area. So there's a, a very significant number of use cases, both with, you know, Oil and gas is also renewables that tie into using data there. So even though that spans a few different industries, that overall theme, I mean, no one questions a theme that's clean tech. They go clean tech, you know, a, a hundred million you know, or a billion dollar clean tech investment fund might span other industries. In that same way, we're building more and more team members that have expertise in that sort of discipline. What excites me the most is health. 
I mean, I think we'll create, you know, a unicorn or two in clean tech. I think we'll create five of them on the health side. When you look at cancer, diabetes, mental health, Alzheimer's, AI, and the merging of AI and biology over the next five to 10 years creates more value for humanity and more value from a financial perspective than I think any other area. But if we just invest in health today, we'd be bankrupt. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's where, like, you're right. I think you need focus over time, right? I'll give you an example in insurance. There will be more, there will be so much value in insurance uh, of machine learning in this space. We've now done, we've had investors in this space. We've had, you know, a dozen plus projects. It is, we have found it one of the absolute hardest areas to actually convince people to buy and to make changes. Like it's just an industry that makes a ton of money that has no incentive to change. So that will be cracked eventually. But if you start up and you're an insure tech venture studio, I don't know that I could with a hundred million dollars guarantee success in that space. Mm -hmm. I know that within AI, because I can compare one industry against each other in, and what you're getting at with your question, focus is always better, right? That's, that's a true principle, but having expertise on a whole, on, on something like AI and being able to actually understand the industries that have the highest potential now for commercialization is part of our pitch to LPs as why we'll make a difference as a studio, right? Like if we were just in one industry, we'd be screwed. Mm, yeah. Until, until you, you find some hack how to sell to insure companies. And, and then you do it, right? So, you know, fund two might, you know, we're like fund one is a general purpose fund, right? But we've debated, should we be doing a clean tech fund, mm. right? Sh should it actually just be, and, and so it could be that like, as you scale it, like you have that focus, it's right? Niche. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to choose. One. And especially when you see all these opportunities at the top of the funnel and they're back and forth. Yeah. And so you need yeah. to develop a team that is like, you know, more in that area. Like we just know that though that we can't compete at consumer process goods, right. Or, or like other areas of e -com. like, mm -hmm. you know, we, we just don't go there because we don't have that expertise. And I mean, it, again, we start with our investment thesis and then the team members that you hire underneath there, you know, we'll probably still 10 to 15% of our investments will still be in health. We'll still continue to do that. But over time, I think that shifts to actually a majority, right. But you, you let industries catch up, right. Like even with the internet, people forget, like, I feel like right now, ChatGPT is the equivalent of Netscape. So you're probably too young, Max, like Netscape. Yeah. Frank, yeah. Did you yeah. ever have Netscape? Yeah. No, there's no way, right? I don't know how old you are, but I'm guessing, right? But Netscape came out, I think it was 94. Like Netscape didn't invent the internet, but it was the first time that most people saw this new communications network and saw some potential. The dot-com crash wasn't until 2000. It was like six years later. Google was barely the top search and like, I don't know the incorporation date for Google, but I can remember in like 2000, we would ask interview questions. Someone would prove that they're really good technically because they would use Google as their search engine instead of Excite or Yahoo, right? Like, which is crazy, right? Like, but you think of the companies that were created from 2002 to 2015 on the internet, right? Like, and that was, and the internet was like decades beforehand. And even the Netscape moment was mid nineties. So I think chat GPT is equivalent to that, where we're going to have a washout, all this hype. There's so much hype that's going out. It's there. It's going to be like the dot-com bubble and everything's going to go down to zero. And that's just fine because that's going to mean we're at like 2002 in the internet. And the next five to 10 years is when billions of dollars of value will be created. Let's talk about different uh, source of cash flow for, for studios and how you decided to launch. Uh, maybe it was just organically or naturally creating AI labs for companies. So what, what are options actually for a studio to be financed? Bootstrapping, just, just paying from your own pocket to, to cover the cost of, of the team until either you get investments from VCs uh, into your studio or you're creating a big fund. And then so sometimes you have exits in, in five plus years. Then you have option to have some agency business or service business what are other options or like how have you thought about about this get a hundred million in assets under management right hundred million uh assets well, to, to to get right. a management fee right right well on the management fee of that so and this is i think so we didn't create a services firm to fund the studio 
I was trying to create AI products and I was trying to get access to data. And then over time I was like, oh, you guys are building a venture studio. I and mean, someone two and a half years ago said something like, oh, I, when you, what's a venture studio, right? <laughs> and, and I think there's been a lot of maturity in the last year or two in terms of the structures. And so now we've fully baked that in for all the reasons in the cap table that we've talked about beforehand. But, you know, we're looking at dozens of investments that are like 10 to 20 K and then lots of, you know, experimentation that is like, let's call it 75 to 125 K. When we're looking at our internal budgeting plans, like one way or another, we're spending a million and a half to two and a half million dollars a year. I'm not saying that there aren't studios where you can't, we don't need that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm saying for sure there's other models than us. I can't. What the way we add value is by putting in that initial work, right? And that's how we justify getting our initial, uh, our initial founder shares. And further, we don't make any money off of it with it in our ventures. Like from back office services to the rest of the technical team, we're just billing that, getting cost reimbursement on that, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know of a model to make this work other than having that agency, that service business locked on. Clearly, that's not the case with, say, flagship pioneering. When you have billions of dollars asset management, you can put in a massive team in place there and you can do a whole bunch of things. Idea Lab, I'm not, I would love to see the PL for Idea Lab in the early days, what that looked like. Clearly, Atomic and, and Highline and, and PSL have kind of figured this out, have gotten to scale. So I think the question for those of us in the ecosystem is how do we get enough funding in to actually have you know, more of those sort of 50 to $150 million studios that are out there so that you can actually have these sort of teams, right? I don't have an easy answer to that question other than unless you have, you either need lots of money or you need this piece of it, or you need to fund, or you need to fund it because you've sold for hundreds of millions of dollars. Like what other options are there? Like, have you seen any other that work? Um, there are some studios that raise some fund, maybe even not not big, but they use this money to to fund their, their team. If they charge, startups for their services so like for actually for for the team or this fund just just covers the cost of the team and gets shares in in companies created yeah. so what do you think about uh, this approach not investing uh, big capital to to the startups maybe even not investing at all but like covering costs sweat equity my bias is always to the side of the founder i have a major issue if there's a situation saying okay you have to use this developer and we're going to charge you this rate for it. I have an ethical issue with that, right? And this is where I get into fights with some other, you know, people around the studio that say, well, no, this is what it's worth. It's the market rate. Well, then go out and sell that person. I mean, if you want to do that, go sell that to, to the, you know, that's why we've made us a, a choice to just try to figure out, you know, to measure costs and have that. And it's at the discretion of the founder. Like if, if you need to fire someone, you should fire them, right? Like you shouldn't, like if you're, if you're a founder, you need to be in operational control. We want to build an edge with the team, but not that. So I acknowledge that that is another path. I would like to see the numbers and how that works out over time, because my experience is great founders want to be completely in control of their team and don't want to be restricted. Yeah. 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 Probably this, this model, when you, when you charge back, it is, you're going to have less motivated founders and less experienced founders. Yeah. And, and like. Even when we go, like we're charging costs for the finance team, they go, hey, this is too much. I'm like, okay, then go do your own finances. Mm. Like, you know, like go hire a controller for 80,000K and go move on or whatever that is, right? Like it's what we've tried to do to mitigate this is we've tried to lay out a bunch of this in advance with sort of principles doc that we've done with founders to say like, here's our mutual agreements with each other, right? It's not a one-sided contract. It's like, here's our commitment to you and your commitment to us. We agree that the goal is to get this standalone as quickly as possible. And wherever we can provide an edge in the short term, we want to. But you also, if you go too far to one side, it hurts the studio. I'll give you an example. We had a situation with one of our ventures, was experiencing, didn't hit its targets, was experiencing some cash flow issues. And so it's like, hey, these uh, two or three engineers that we had on our team, you can take them back. And this was like on a Saturday, they're like, take them back Monday. <laughs> well, you know, like that's not reasonable either. There needs to be some kind of back and forth because like in real life, you wouldn't, you know, you have to actually fire those people. Like, so it's like, we'll keep these people busy for the next two months while I figure out my next raise and come back. Like that's not fair to the studio. So there needs to be that agreement back and forth in terms of it. So I respect that other studios might be able to have that model. For us, it doesn't work. For us, it's you need some, 
you know, we've put in our own personal capital. So it's kind of hybrid. Um, my partner, Nicole and I, we're the largest investors in AltML. So there's been that funding. We've raised external capital to kind of fund it. So yes, we've raised external capital. We've got cash flow from the services business. And then we're trying to be able to get the money for the fund in that. I think one other hybrid here we haven't talked about is using special purpose vehicles. So SPVs to be able to actually fund those early stage businesses. So say your fund's not ready yet. We've had a lot of success or a lot of recent success, at least with, with our, our last deal, syndicating out for that one specific opportunity. And then you move it off the studio's balance sheet because it's like, hey, you know, we've raised now a million and a half dollars for this one opportunity. It's not a full fund yet, but like by being able to do that, we at least have the capital to pay for that team. So they're no longer seconded. They can actually join the venture full time. That's more work for each one. But, you know, we'll likely put out SPVs for our next number of deals because, it's much easier to get an investor to continue for one opportunity than a blank check fund, obviously. How big this is AI edge uh, now in your team? So can you compare it with uh, a potential independent entrepreneur willing to launch a similar company, but in the wild without, without your uh, studio? So like, what challenges will they face and uh, how can you compare those two, two ways? Yeah, so... It's always hard to get your technical founder in any business. I think it's even more difficult now because now you need not just the software engineering side and the cloud side, but also the data science side. If you are an AI first business, these people are making very, very high salaries. And often at the onset, you need the right architecture, the right planning, the right understanding, but then the rest of the team to comes in. You can go out and raise a five or $10 million seed round in the Valley and you know, you've got the budget to be able to hire those people. Unless you've raised that amount of money to be able to get, you know, say 25% or 50% of that 10 year experience PhD, you don't want that person necessarily doing all the code and you know, you can't afford that person fully, but you need to at least have say a, a team of three to four people plus the senior team and have that tie in with the software engineering and all the rest of it. I would argue that the edge that we provide is substantial because it's very difficult to find these people. There's a whole bunch of different specialties and skill sets in there. So if we go down this path, I can bring in someone who's an expert in LLMs versus computer vision versus time series because we've got such a deep bench on that. Mm -hmm. And then as important, our team, what we say is we're we're fully committed to our team within Ultimate proper, the mothership, to be able to actually move off to any of the ventures. So from a recruitment point of view, I think that's a real edge. Mm -hmm. On top of all that is the overall experience in terms of like after doing 400 plus AI projects, I think there's a lot of things that we've learned there that even just guide and not making the same decisions. And so getting it, you know, if you're selling to enterprise, often we can have an introduction for a first customer, but as much as anything, we know what it takes to actually get things done. So all those things add into the edge and it's worked so far. Um, I mean, proof will be in the results for, for, you know, our returns over the next few years though, Max. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, super. Let's try to sum up some, some main ideas from this interview. First, I think that like now you are in a very good position because you've done it before for many years and now it's a trend and you're like 10 steps uh, ahead of, of all other teams. This is the first. So like it's occasionally or it's like your long-term vision that you, you chose this AI direction. Then like second, uh, that probably in some time there will be many teams in AI and you, you'll have to find some, some focus when you can, uh, lo in long term, deliver some additional value because maybe even this talent, so now it is, uh, uh, it's advantage that you have it. And maybe in future also, there would be, uh, like, it also will be effective that, like, CTO, uh, uh, fractional CTO, you know, this, like, services. So probably uh, having a studio with uh, very experienced uh, technical people is, is like, Having fractional CTO at the cost for for your startups, probably. Yeah, I think if you if you believe that AI is going to eat all software and all software will be AI based in five years, ten years, twenty years, whatever that is, right? We're chasing that goal or we're chasing that thesis, and it just so happens that we're using a studio as the best way to actually pursue that opportunity because of of four hundred projects. 
experience. Yeah, and so because of the difficulty, in it, like how do you get data in in the AI space, right? Like you know, mm-hmm. we're, yeah. you know, that's led to the commercial model. So we're the accidental studio. But as I think through it, and as I talk to others mm-hmm. in the space, it's like this makes a ton of sense because now we've got an entity that's cash flowing, that has upside to the carry, um, that can build IP internally. And we've got now the ability to make a whole bunch of other bets. And, and, and as our fund is fully up and operational, it'll allow us to make dozens of bets in applied AI over the next few years. And mm-hmm. as long as you agree and say like, hey, this is like the internet, is it an advantage to like have cloud or internet developers? Of course not, right? But that's like all technology, right? So what's the edge for any VC, your network, your people? There's still all that. It's still about people. It's still about who are the relationships we have with founders, who are the relationships we have with, with, with LPs, right? How are you developing a better investment thesis to better allocate capital? In the long run, that's all of our edge. In the short run, I will attract the best founders because we will be one of the best places on the planet in which to build an applied AI business in a vertical segment, targeted enterprise. If you fit that bucket, we want to talk to you, right? Because I want to convince you that internally you will make more money faster with our studio. And I think it'll be a lot more fun too. So I think you've kind of nailed it. It's like, it's like there's a different flavor of it. It's like, you know, studio because of AI here, but not, we might be different than many others that are like pure from the financial side. To me, what makes this exciting is like, this is entrepreneurship at scale, you know, to be able to actually, like I've done it a bunch of times myself. Can I actually succeed in helping and supporting and working with other entrepreneurs in that space? I don't know. Like I know I can build shit myself. Can I actually build an entity that allows others to do it? Well, I mean, that's the fun in it, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll try to, to, to continue with, with my point. So three, it is like, you have an age because uh, you, you you saw and you worked with 400 AI uh, projects. And so like it's much easier to, to any entrepreneur to start with with this experience than like doing their own mistakes and understanding what, what is yep. where to collect data and so on. Then the fourth idea is having some source, some cash flow uh, might be more feasible for for a studio to survive because like when you when you just are wasting money it's not so good <laughs> for a person when you only lose money and you don't have some some sort of source of income having some service business or i don't know some or ability to fundraise big amount and cover uh, costs with with management fee or some other model fifth idea so it's it's a hypothesis for me but when you when you say that you fell in love with every idea you meet, so I think it, it is like maybe already fifth time when I am I am thinking that studio founders they have shining object syndrome when right. like hundred oh, percent about me totally yeah. right process matters it's like it's it sounds like heretical to say process matters to an entrepreneur but it's true like process has to matter right. Yeah. So, and I think that like, it's for me, it's very attractive because I feel about, uh, about many ideas. So when I focus for some idea for 30 minutes, then I see a lot of opportunities <laughs> in this idea. Maybe probably there are people with less of this shining object syndrome and they are not so inclined to start their studios because like, I want to focus only on one problem, long time. This idea, and six, I remember that you talked about importance of relations with personal brand will attract founders uh, to your team and it's hard to do it in, in, in other ways, right? Yeah, and I'd say, and, and I should make clarify, that's not just about me there, right? That's about, you know, uh, the rest of the team and everything as you're involved in the ecosystem and and, and you're a player there and, and, you and you know, you build that reputation. I think that, uh, it didn't, and that's no different than any other venture fund. It's always about relationships. It's always about that, right? But if we can prove as an industry, for if we're an industry, that we're going to tilt those odds of early stage. If we're going to go from a 90% failure rate, however you measure it, to an 80% failure rate. Mm. When you model that across portfolios and across an industry, it's game changing, right? So I think there's a lot of studios out there that are better than an 80% failure rate, Mm. right? And so you've touched on so many important points in terms of how you pay for it and get that phase of it. But really, what edge do you offer? Unless you're focused on adding an edge, unless you're focused on the Mm, entrepreneur, the founder is the most important person, I think you're fucked, right? So yes, those edges aren't forever. 
In our case, we think that's AI over it's not, but there's some basic fundamentals here in terms of how we tilt those odds of success, how we actually build those right relationships, and then over time, how you can scale that. I don't know. It's, it's just, I feel like now's the time, right? Like it's such an ex, it's such an exciting time to actually be in a studio where maybe we don't have a lot of respect, but we're getting a little bit. You know, can you imagine in two or three years when you don't have to explain to every LP what a studio is, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. And you've got the tracker and you've got a bunch of these things, like then it gets really exciting of what you can create and how this model allows you to actually scale. Uh, and in our case, like I hope we're sitting here in 10 years, I'm talking about like the multiple unicorns we've created in oncology, in, you know, mental health, in diabetes, right? Like, because data is going to be used to transform everything we do. And there's no nothing more important than health, right? Now, if you can make a dent in climate change along the way, hey, not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Corey. Great, great insights. Uh, th thank you.